Pleased, very privileged to have uh, five uh, producer panelists. Uh, apologize for uh, an error here. There are five panelists, and there are four name tags, but we'll. Uh, so we're a little crowded, but uh, hope, hopefully we get through this okay. Uh, and uh, we're very privileged to have these people that are with the, the routine is going to be they're they're each going to provide us a a presentation and a presentation time to give us their views and, uh, and their experiences, and uh, and then we'll, we're we're going to follow that up with uh, with a Q and A session uh, when they're when they're finished with their presentation. So. Or I suppose if you have a burning question during their presentation, fire away. Where this is informal enough that we can do that as well. But uh, so let's. Uh, so we'll start out with uh, Brian Bolt. Uh, Brian is and his family live in Anderson, South Carolina, where they raise uh, commercial cattle and sheep. Uh, he's the manager of business development for Ag AgriClear. Uh, he's also been a faculty member at Clemson. Uh, and uh, he's also served as executive director of the South Carolina Cattlemen's Association. Uh, and uh, so with that, I think I'm just going to turn the floor over to uh, Brian Bolt. Go ahead. Perfect. And thank you. Uh, let me say thank you also for the invitation to be here. It's quite an honor. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount over the last couple of days, and, and almost anything I could say I think has been said much clearer and more effectively this morning by the experts. Uh, I, I'm beginning to think my role here is so you all can lay eyes on a cow-calf producer, one, but also one of these elusive ones from the southeast. So, <laughs> It's also made very clear. Thank you, guys. So I'll try to sufficiently embarrass us before we're done. But uh, In, in the, the conference call the other day, it was also made very clear if we do our job right at the cow-calf level, the rest of this becomes much easier. So uh, if you need to do any advanced diagnostics on me, that's okay. Uh, as stated in the bio, my family and I uh, raise cattle and, and sheep. I don't know why I put that in there. Maybe it's just to confirm what you probably already think, uh, but, but we do. Uh, a little, little bit about our history of BVD. We've always been the commercial cow-calf business, and we've always vaccinated as, as suggested by our, our veterinarian and, and had never really been concerned with testing until we started a little reset business and donor management business. And, you know, having some recent degrees and being what I thought was smart, I thought we could differentiate ourselves from others in that sector and, and offer some advanced testing and recips and some advanced service work. Uh, and then really just came out pretty disappointed in that thing. Test the cows, you don't find any, and I, you know, I don't know what you're really hoping for when you test. I don't know if you hope to find one. Uh, but not finding any, we felt like we could offer our customers some, some advanced assuredness that we're doing our job. And, and for most of them, they could have cared less, so that, that kind of became disappointing. So as we rolled that out across our cow herd, and again, still didn't find any, we've heard that quite often, you know, you're thankful for that, but th there are times where you'd love to find that smoking gun and, hey, well, here's our problem, let's just remove it and, and let's fix all our problems. Uh, you know, some other things begin to happen, and, and so if, if nothing else, I think my role here is to offer some of the cow-calf perspective, uh, but also a little bit of the psychology, the cultural reasons why some of these really easy things that you all have described very eloquently just aren't happening. Uh, and I'd also suggest you guys don't take it personally. Uh, I taught for a long time, and the worst position you could ever be in is if you have higher expectations of a student than they had for themselves. You know, you think they're there to earn an A, they just need to pass the class. And so they're putting out that appropriate amount of effort, and, and in this objective piece where you're doing what you're doing, you just become frustrated. So guys, don't be frustrated and don't take it personal. Um, I'd also echo the sentiments from Dr. Peel this morning that any behavior that we have at the cow-calf level, the market should should create. It should incentivize that. And, and maybe we're talking about the same side or of a coin or two different sides, but, but maybe there should be disincentives for not doing, doing the right thing. And, and a bit of reality from the cow-calf side, and, and we began to really notice this as we ramped up our reset program, is all of a sudden that ability to crank out truckload lots that can really travel anywhere in the U.S. and and are of desire anywhere in the U.S. just doesn't happen anymore. So when you step down to that less than load lot piece, some of these incentives that exist at that load lot piece just aren't there. And, and it's further exacerbated in the southeast by lack of infrastructure. Now, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that we do lots of things right in the southeast, but I don't think we do everything wrong either. But you also have to appreciate our complete lack of infrastructure in some areas. You know, you know we have our, our seed stock producers, we have our commercial cow-calf producers, there's practically no feeding in the southeast for very obvious reasons. So if nothing else, there's going to be a whole lot of asphalt between our calves 
uh, as they leave our place and maybe stop off somewhere intermediate or probably end up getting fed. Uh, and so, you know, those realities alone kind of make it a little more complicated. You make that even worse with less than load lots, so you create this aggregator class of folks who do a really good job of putting calves together and hopefully putting like calves together as, as much as is possible. And, and I'll contend to, to you guys that that group of folks understands animal health as good as anybody. They're in the, in the trenches. I uh, uh, heard a discussion yesterday about high-risk calves. You know, that's where the margins are. And so those guys are really good at it. Now, I'm not suggesting that they're fixing all your problems in the feedlot, and I think it's pretty clear they're not. Uh, but those guys probably bear the brunt of, of us not testing or my neighbor not testing or not an appropriate vaccination uh, protocol. A few other observations that I've heard, uh, whether we like it or not, cow-calf producers can't see and hold BVD. Uh, you know, if you, your cow's got some type of external parasite problem, that's pretty, pretty obvious. Maybe you're embarrassed by it. Maybe an animal health company builds a paintball gun to let you go out and blow off some steam and do it. But, you know, other than the little swab thing, we can't just look at them and say it. And, and this has been especially true in my time in academia and in, in time on the farm here. Uh, I think there's a lot of guys who begin to accept less than optimal production as their normal. And so they say things like, this is the best I can do. You know, you look at their numbers, I look at their numbers, and you understand 80% conception rate is just not acceptable. Nowhere in the world is it acceptable, but they've never had anything higher than that. Now, now what's the cause? Well, maybe it's BVD. Maybe that's an easier problem to solve, but, but maybe there's a whole host of things that work there. And, and so I would just part with the thought here is, as you guys show up at outfits and, and, you know, the folks you've taught and you've advised show up at outfits, um, Anytime you can get on the outfit and it's not an emergency, you've done a whole lot of good work. You know, that, that alone, you're not the EMT in the thing. You're not out there pulling the calf and doing those things. You, you've gone a long way. Uh, and then don't give up when the BVD is not the culprit. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a systems approach. And, and as I've been here the last two or three days, but especially today, I think BVD may be a people problem. Now, now not, not consuming the, you know, the PI meat. I don't mean that. I don't want to start that rumor. Uh, but I think it may be a cultural people problem, and so maybe if nothing else, we should put some psychologists on the stage and, I don't know, give them a paintball gun or something. I'll just keep going back to that. Let's make it easy. So, again, my, my pleasure here. My tag says panelists. That means I need to, to hush and respond to any questions I have. Uh, but, again, thank you for the opportunity. Next up is Brian Keith. Uh, Brian is owner and manager of Keith Cattle Company. Uh, he has over 25 years experience in starting and backgrounding lightweight calves. Uh, he sees over 15,000 head a year. He's also a partner in a 300 cow uh, commercial uh, uh, cow herd. So uh, we've got a lot of experience here. Uh, Brian and, and his wife Lisa have three sons and four grandsons with one son uh, working on the ranch as, a, as, a, as an integral part of the operation. So. Brian, we're looking forward. I'm, you've got some deep experience, and we're looking forward to it. I guess I shouldn't forget you're a you're a 1983 K-State Animal Science grad. So, uh, and uh, so Thank you very much. Like Brian said, it's really a privilege to be asked to come participate in one of these things like this, and I think they're very, very necessary and very, very good to to get our message. We need to step forward as a producer, as a cow-calf operator, and let people know what we're doing and what we're trying to do. Uh, here seven, eight years ago, we went through a complete environmental upgrade on our facilities and we became environmentally compliant. Um, you know, that's a big deal. And to go to that and to try to produce beef and to raise cattle and do it environmentally compliant and adhere to all the rules and everything that comes along with it, you know, is, is really, really, uh, not everybody can get that done. Uh, Brian talked about being the southeast producer. I'm the recipient of those calves that come from the southeast. We get load lots of these calves that come from an order buyer that are assembled one or two or three or five at a time. They may come from 50 or 60 different farms or ranches different management programs, different vaccine programs, maybe none at all, very little nutritional. Our goal when we re receive those calves is to get all those calves at, on the same plane of nutrition, on the same plane of health, ready to go on to the next step. 
whether that be a grazing situation, whether they're going to weed or rye, or whether they're going to native grass, or they're going on to a, a farmer feeder backgrounder, or straight into a commercial feed yard, and try to get that done as soon as possible. Uh, BVD has been a big, 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 big problem over the years. We started PI testing years ago uh, with Cattle Empire and Dr. Bill Hessman out at Satana, and uh, that was where we first got our first experience. But we test every calf that comes off that truck. The calves are, come into our facility the next morning. Uh, we get them up, feed them, and water them. They're weighed and counted, make sure everything's right. They go through the chute usually that either that next afternoon or the following morning, and we collect an ear notch. Our veterinarian, uh, Stan Perry, has a lab right here in Emporia, Kansas, which is 30 miles down the road from us, and we, uh, we take those samples to him as soon as we're done. I know tomorrow morning which ones are hot. You know, within 12 to 14 hours of arrival, 24 hours of arrival, we know which calves are, are hot. We pull those calves off. Every calf is individually identified. Pull those calves off, and they go to a quarantine pen, and they stay there till they either die or we harvest them. Um, keeping those cattle isolated is just paramount. I have another challenge with uh, my cow herd. I've got a 300 head cow herd with a partner, and trying to run 300 head of cows and manage a background facility with 3,000 calves and you know, just the facilities, keeping your cows away from those calves that could possibly bring in BBD. We receive calves every week, you know, 50 weeks out of the year. So, you know, it, it's there's a constant flow through there. But we put in an additional set of handling facilities so our cows don't go through the same chute as our calves go through, which minimizes their exposure. We also try to keep we don't put our cows next to any of these ranch calves or any of these calves that are coming in, you know, through the yard or, you know, trying to keep that, you know, minimized. Um, when we harvest those PI calves, uh, we usually hamburger those things. We take them to as far as we can get them. Usually it's 750 to 800 pounds. Sometimes they'll make nine. But we've learned by experience that if those calves get sick, they're dead. We've never saved a calf, a PI calf that we've treated. We take them to a local hamburger place or a local packer right there in Emporia or Allen, and we have those things just ground up into hamburger, and we sell them direct out of there. They never go back to town. Uh, we've had a couple customers that wanted to sell them back through a, a local sale barn, and we put a great big pink PI on them and two tags in their ear that say PI. They're announced at the dock when we unload their PI positives. And when they go through the ring, they sell after all the rest of the cattle are sold, and they're sold as known true PIs. But that's only happened twice, and I don't like it. But, you know, that's the crutch of our industry is what are we going to do with those PIs? And, you know, so far today, that's the best option we have is to, try to take them as far as we can get them and then, and then get rid of them. So I PI test all my cows. I PI test all my, my calves off my cow steers and heifers every year to make sure that we don't have a contamination there. So all of our bulls that we purchase are PIs. All of our heifers that we keep are all from within our own herd. So I don't bring other heifers in from the outside. That's how we try to manage around the PI or the BBD. So. In a nutshell, that's what our operation is and does. I'm really, really fortunate to have my son, Justin, come back and, and be involved. We have two other employees that are full-time employees. We take care of about 10,000 acres of summer grass and run that feed yard, which has you know, got about 3,000 head of capacity. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll be around for questions. Thank you. Next is uh, Daryl Busby. Uh, Daryl uh, worked for about 30 years as a beef extension specialist for Iowa State University. Uh, I think he's, you probably recognize him. He's been a frequent speaker and uh, presenter in the industry for a long, long time. Uh, so he's going to talk to us about the Tri-County uh, Carcass Futurity, I believe. So 
which he's engaged with now. So I think we'll just turn the floor over to Daryl. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dale. Again, uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. About uh, And I was asked to represent the feedlot perspective, but I thought it may be important that you understand a little bit about Tri-County Steer Carcass Maturity. Uh, we started in 1982 uh, with 35 Iowa producers right down the southwest corner, 106 steers, and they wanted to know what was the most profitable steer to produce or have in the feedlot. In the last 14 years, done a little over 97,000 head from 27 states, um, like Brian uh, Bolt said, mostly south and east. It's, it's hard to uh, truck cattle across Nebraska with the cheap uh, corn there. Uh, we have a 12-member board, I think, that has oversight over the program. There's no feedlot operators that are on the board. The seven of them are cow-calf producers that all put calves in the feedlot. And one of their primary jobs is to select the six feedlots on an annual basis that feed for us. The other five uh, board members, two are veterinarians, have uh, both cow-calf and uh, feedlot uh, customers are in uh, southwest Iowa. Um, then we have a, a couple of other, or three other agribusiness representatives and stuff. So what do we do? First, we collect growth and carcass data. All calves are weighed on arrival. Uh, we body condition score. USDA market reporters collect uh, frame score, muscle score on the cattle. Um, we do uh, on-test weight, disposition scores, reimplant weights, disposition scores, and then we collect what I call full carcass data at the packing plant, hot carcass weight, ribeye area, fat cover, kidney, pelvic, and heart fat, marbling score, calculated yield grade, yield grade marbling score, and uh, final quality grade. We uh, prepare those reports, send them out to the consigners, the original owners of the cattle. Uh, producers like that to be able to do comparisons. They always want to know how their cattle are doing compared to other people. And I think some people, uh, again, don't realize how good or how bad their cattle are until they have some opportunity to do comparison. And the more information they provide, the more data we analyze. About 72% of the cattle we have known birth dates on and 62% we have known uh, sires on. Uh, our board feels strongly you got to uh, use this information to get better every day, that our real competition is the other proteins and not each other. Um, so we provide the genetic growth, health, carcass, and cost return data on retained ownership cattle. About 95% of the cattle we feed are uh, belong to the original owner. We do have data that says as you give them that feedback, they do make improvements, whether it's management, a better vaccination program, weaning the calves 30 days, getting the calves bunk broke, make genetic ch changes in gain and marbling score. Um, they also produce uh, calmer cattle as time goes by. Uh, the the non-replacement heifers that we feed have poor dispositions on their steer mates. And all those things do add up to more profit. And the board's... Uh, always been um, anxious to share this information. I think uh, Dr. Larry Cora um, in Certified Angus Beef did a great job in helping us publicize what we do, but the board wants to share that information. And uh, again, we think people make the difference. Like uh, Brian said, this is more about people. And best management practices have no boundaries. Uh, I would remind you we published data that uh, the differences between the Midwest calves and Southeast calves are very little difference. The calves from the Southeast are slightly older, slightly heavier, but they gain just as well as the Midwest cattle. And I would tell you zip code has nothing to do with the quality of cattle that are produced. Uh, cow calf producers who retain ownership are suddenly responsible for the genetics, health, and management of their calves. You have truly a teachable moment. The people that really produce, participate in this and like it are early adopters of technology. Many of them have been uh, DNA testing now the replacement heifer selection. They also are, uh, use a team of advisors. Um, if, if they have a nutrition issue, they may use an extension specialist, a feed salesman, or, or respected uh, beef producer in there, and the same will go with health issues. Uh, they may con use their uh, local veterinarian, but also maybe extension veterinarian or pharmaceutical uh, veterinarian to uh, try and get at the answers. 
Many of them will tell you they're tired of someone else benefiting from all of, uh, of the effort that they put in. They also believe in working and sharing information. Uh, that uh, We have a few people that did not like um, the sharing of uh, information. We started out to add profit. That's still our number one goal. And I would remind you that profit is gross income minus cost of production. I would hope the feedlot industry learned that in the last year. Um, over 55% of the cattle we feed are from producers with less than 80 calves available to feed. In other words, by the time they pull out the replacement heifers, they don't have enough calves to have their own pen. So the only way to take advantage of what they're doing are co-mingling with like-minded uh, producers' calves. And again, we do some benchmarking uh, software that we developed so they can again compare similar ex sex, weight, and age of cattle on arrival to see what their strengths are. Disadvantages. If you retain ownership, you're suddenly responsible for what you did. And telling a cow-calf producer calves are not the best is worse than saying his daughter is ugly. <laughs> um, I'd tell you 35% of the cow-calf people are uh, very pleasantly surprised how good their calves are. Uh, we've identified some herds that uh, tremendous, um, uh, we, we've got a herd here in uh, northern Missouri that runs 80, 85% choice, 80, 85% um, uh, yield grade ones and twos. And last year those steers gained 4.07 pounds a day. Uh, tremendous genetic and management practice. 55% of the producers are what I call in the middle. They have some strengths and weaknesses, but they're interested in improving. And then we have 10% that thinks it's the worst thing they ever heard in their life and uh, want no part of it in the future. Um, this is our health protocol uh, that we ask. And, and <clears throat> excuse me, we do have some data that the calves are weaned uh, an average or less than 30 days. Uh, average days weaned was 23. That's the same as not having the calves weaned 30 days. Now, in our data, we see no difference between weaning 30 days and 45 days, but because producers can't count how many days they're weaned, <clears throat> I think the 45 days is a, is a good approach. Um, so that's what we ask. This is our um, vaccination program that our two veterinarians have developed and has posted on our website. Um, to me, it's an Iowa preconditioning program. That's kind of what we've always stuck with. But uh, as Bob Larson said, sometimes there's recommendations in reality. And, uh, not, you know, our recommendations aren't always carried out. Sometimes stuff happens. I have a f different word for that. But we, we found a producer that was disinfecting his uh, uh, vaccination gun with, uh, between each injection. We found refrigerators that freeze vaccines. We've had people mix up Modified Live at 7.30 in the morning to use it at 1 p.m. And then uh, another producers have thought that the vaccinations were a waste of money, and our data would say, no, that's not true. So in uh, the mid-'90s, uh, when Dr. Annette O'Connor uh, first came to Iowa State, they were looking to do some survey work. And so we sampled um, calves. Uh, delivered in, uh, in uh, October, November, December. Ended up we had 1,714 calves, and they were all, they, I'd say about 90% of those calves were from Iowa and just a few um, calves from northern, extremely northern Missouri. Um, the samples were evaluated in the ISU lab as they had time, and, but the results weren't reported to us until April of, of the next year. And we had three positives uh, from three different herds, and so four-tenths of a percent positives. And all three had died between delivery, and uh, we got the lab results. And we, one of our requirements is we po post all cattle by a feedlot veterinarian. And two were called chronics, and one was acute. And two of the producers then took this information, worked with their own veterinarian, removed the positive cows from the cow herd, did some testing, and got everything. The third producer was a seed stock producer, and he was sure the calf was infected at the feedlot, and he spent the next 12 years of his life telling everybody that uh, how terrible 
this program was, and it, it was not his uh, fault and stuff. So that was our experience. One of the states then we worked with said, well, why don't you test all our kids on arrival and for BVD and our feedlots and veterinarians say, yeah, we can, we can handle that. And then one of the feedlots asked the question, but what are you going to do with the positive PIs? And they said, we'll take them to Sailborn in Iowa and sell them. <laughs> and, and our board said in no way were they going to be a part of that. And, and we did not do any more testing then for other uh, states or other consigners. But I know a lot of the herds that we work with began to do testing, and I know they've made some progress and, and uh, d have continued to do sampling to make sure they're, they're clean. Um, we also did some uh, things at that time. If you had PI negative groups, we segregated them in the feedlots. And one thing that's been a plus, about 10, 8, 10 years ago, when the pen size was really reduced in the Iowa feedlots, the feedlots are really good about their design then, not to have much nose-to-nose -nose contact. Each pen has its own individual water, typically in the middle of the pen. And so I think we've done some things there. One of our feedlot veterinarians, uh, when he was doing post, uh, he would collect an ear notch then from mortalities, and we had a full panel. He would submit them to uh, Iowa State Diagnostic Lab for testing. We did find a few positives there, and then the producer worked with our local veterinarian on what to do. Uh, we've had a few backgrounders um, begin to send us some cattle over the years, and um, the, our feedlot veterinarian said they thought the best protocol was we ear notched all of them, we can get the turnaround that uh, Brian Ken and Emporia, but we ran about 1% uh, positives. We took all those positives and removed them from the pen. The PLAS would tell you that once those positives were removed, the respiratory pulls in the pen and the rest of the cattle really diminished. Uh, and we've only had one positive that we know of that actually made it to uh, uh, live to a thousand pound live weight, and we sent it to packing plant. And after uh, Dan's uh, discussion today, I question whether that was very good. Um, because I'll be in the nursing home in the next 15, 20 years, I've told people for years this respiratory stuff cost us millions of dollars. You folks all know that in the room. But here's our data from 2004 what one treatment, two treatments cost in the feedlot, and what blows my mind is this is 2014, uh, just re and analyzing the data. So as veterinarians, you got a lot of work that uh, is ahead of you, and uh, you can do it. So I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. Thank you. Next is uh, Kelly Cunningham. And uh, really appreciate Kelly being here. Kelly has, uh, has a bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. in dairy nutrition. Uh, he's, uh, he's a partner in Milk Unlimited Dairy Farms, Atlantic, Iowa. They house about 3,400 cows at that location. Uh, and he also has some partner interest in another larger dairy, an 8,000-cow dairy, in the panhandle of Texas. Uh, so I'm, uh, he has some other inf information here, but I think he'll probably relate that in how he handles the heifers or how calves go off-site, come back on-site, and how they relate to his operation. So, Kelly. Thank you guys for uh, having me here. Um, I've, I picked up some good stuff in the um, presentations this morning and some useful things, and uh, really appreciate that. Um, are there a lot of dairy guys here? Okay, hold your hands up with pride, guys. Come on. We're outnumbered. we got to kind of uh, show them a little bit here. Uh, Ben's it's mainly beef, guys, though. I will go quite slower than I normally do in a dairy uh, presentation. So uh, uh, people like Daryl that's almost in, um, almost in the nursing home will be able to keep up. Uh, we, uh, we milk cows in Iowa. We milk cows in Texas. Uh, sell about uh, five loads of milk a day in Iowa, sell about 11 loads of milk a day in, in Texas. Um, this is our Iowa facility. We saw some nice pictures of the Paris facility a while ago. Uh, we are totally confined there, uh, total confinement. We're a tunnel-ventilated system, so we uh, cool the cows in the summer, uh, 
usually can maintain about 15 degrees cooler than outside. In the wintertime, uh, we can maintain a little bit higher barn temperatures, uh, which also cuts down on the ice and the frozen stuff in the barns as well. Uh, beautiful green Iowa. This is Texas. <laughs> Not quite as green. Uh, we're all outside in Texas. Uh, we have a, a double 60 barn there, the big parlor. Uh, the other parlor up there kind of on the top uh, r left of the screen is, is just a double 24. We milk a few cows over there, milk our hospital, milk our fresh cows over there. Um, both dairies, uh, we run a full replacement heifer program. There's no bulls on the farm, uh, so we AI everything, uh, use a lot of sex semen, trying to get as many uh, female, as many heifers as we can. Um, it seems like uh, we're never satisfied with the number of cows we have, and we always want to get more. So um, the keys to success in dairy, and most of you probably know this, it's the same in most all of our businesses, we got to control our costs. Um, Feed costs on a dairy, typically 45 to 55 percent of the cost, so feed is number one. Uh, labor, some of these other things come in there, uh, growing your replacement heifers are, are right there along with that. We also need to improve performance. We, we seem to constantly want to get more milk production. Somebody was talking about conception rates in dairy uh, this morning. We're trying to always get better, get more cows bred quicker, shorter time window. Um, our herd health is important. We want healthy cows. They tend to milk a little more uh, than the cows that are sick or lame or, or have other problems. And then again, we try to grow. We try to uh, uh, build more dairies, so we need a constant supply of replacement heifers. These guys need to be as healthy as we can make them and also genetically superior to their mothers or the rest of the herd so that we can make progress and achieve that goal of higher uh, milk production. Oh, skipped one. This is just our milking parlor. We, we, uh, we do 30 on a side. This is the Iowa, Iowa facility, so we have 60 head total. Um, our March production was the best we've ever gotten. We were 86 pounds of milk per cow, so just about 10 gallons of milk per cow uh, every day of March for our cows in, in the Iowa facility. So what do we do to try and control BVD, or what's our strategy uh, on the farm? Uh, we vaccinate the heck out of things. Um, Cows are vaccinated pre-breeding, so they're open cows after they've had their baby. Uh, about 35 days in milk is when they get their uh, pre-breed uh, vaccination for both types one and two. Calves get their first one about 35 days. They get their second one about 28 days after that. I was a little unclear until I, uh, when I made this slide and emailed it, but I've since figured that out. So they get the first one at 35 days, the second one at 63 days. And then once they make it through that, uh, they, they're moved to the feedlot and they get a pre-breed vaccination at the feedlot kind of as a booster. And then at the second preg check, which is about 90 days pregnant, they're going to get another uh, uh, vaccination with uh, type 1 and 2. Iowa facility again, totally enclosed. These cows are inside uh, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Uh, we feed uh, lots and lots of feed. Uh, this particular pen is, a, is about 110 pounds. Uh, milk per day, eating about 130 pounds of as-fed feed or about 57 pounds of dry matter. So uh, they eat a lot. <clears throat> Biosecurity, we talk about that. We want to do good there. We're not, always, we're not always achieving that goal. We do test all heifer calves that are born on the farm. We test anything purchased and that's brought in. Those are mainly springers. So those are mainly bred heifers uh, a month or two away from calving. If we do buy outside of our facility, we try to buy from uh, direct from the grower or the producer. Uh, try not to buy a lot of put-together cattle. Try not to buy a lot of cattle that have been exposed to a lot of different things. Um, feed buckets and manure buckets are separate. I know a lot of guys uh, uh, have, have adopted that, but we try to feed with a different bucket on the loader than we uh, scrape the, the manure with or, or load the spreader with. Uh, sometimes we forget. Um, and we're working uh, towards a closed herd. Uh, with the use of sex semen and with, the, with a little bit better pregnancy rates, we are able to generate a lot more heifers uh, than we could have uh, five and ten years ago. Uh, breeding has gotten better. So baby calves are housed in hutches, uh, just the, the plastic hutches. This is, uh, uh, they're housed individually. There's no nose-to-nose -nose contact. They're uh, bottle-fed. Uh, they're in these huts for about 70 days, uh, 65 to 70 days. Um, we started ear notching uh, back in October of 2010. Uh, we do sample all the heifers, uh, calves, and all the purchased animals. 
we send them up to South Dakota uh, for uh, testing up there, and we do the pool thing right now. We, we used to could do 40 or 50 in a pool. Now I think we're down to 20 uh, in a pool. And uh, the positive test, if it's a baby calf, we just put that calf down immediately uh, when we get that test back. If it's a springer or a heavy bread, we just send her to uh, center right where our cold cows go, and that goes right to hamburger, basically. Again, the babies are uh, can't touch each other. These are super big hutches, about five by by nine, uh, and, and they're that big, number one, so they can't touch, but number two, uh, because they're in there for that 70 days. So recent positives, I, I just want to tell you about two recent positives that we've had. Um, calf number 33626, a baby calf, uh, tested positive. The pool tested positive, and then when the pool tests, you know, they do the whole thing. Uh, we tracked down that heifer, uh, that was uh, 622 of 15. That calf was born to a heavy springer that we purchased. The mama tested negative, but the calf tested positive. So kind of classic deal here uh, going on. Uh, calf number 30651, baby calf, she uh, popped positive 123 of 14. Tracked her down, looked at her. Um, she uh, was also came from a heavy springer that we purchased. We no longer purchased from this guy. Uh, we've had just, uh, and this isn't a lot, I, I mean, I'm, I shouldn't say it negatively, but uh, we're trying to get away from this uh, supplier. And uh, somebody else said this morning about maybe we could see these calves, or they look stunned, or they look bad, or something. These calves were beautiful. My guys at the calf ranch uh, didn't like me when I said these have to be put down. They, uh, these calves were, were superstars. They looked good. They were playing the part. Now, maybe they weren't old enough to uh, start having a lot of problems, but uh, you can't tell. The mamas, uh, I looked back today, uh, the mama of uh, 3651 is still in the herd, bred back, doing well. Uh, everything's cool there, which we'd expect. Uh, the mama of the other calf, 33626, has been cold and, and uh, didn't perform in our facility. Uh, just another cow pick. Everybody likes cows. Uh, so historically, we started in 2010. Uh, we've had two purchased Springer's test positive. Believe it or not, one of these was a purebred animal, uh, came from a breed association sale, and uh, they quickly uh, reimbursed me for that, and, and we sent that, cow, uh, that heifer out as well. Uh, the other purchased one was from uh, a supplier in New York. We've had about six baby calves uh, test positive over the uh, 16 years or so here that we've been doing this, and they've all been put down. In total, 9,586 calves have been tested, 3,075 springers. So uh, I don't know, uh, eight out of, what, 12, 13,000 cows that probably is maybe just a scotch better than what we would expect. Uh, what can we say, I guess? Um, we, we feel our vaccination protocol is working pretty good. We've not had a lot of, of uh, PIs from home-raised cattle, well-vaccinated cattle. Cattle is probably receiving twice of what they could get by with as a minimal vaccination program. Uh, this isn't hard. Uh, our baby calves are tested about a day, day or two old. Uh, we uh, pull those samples. We get the results back before they're commingled. Uh, it's pretty easy to do for us um, in our facility. We believe the herd health in the calf program has, has gotten a little better from this. I, I don't know that we can tell you that a whole lot of um, – uh, positive things have been seen in the cows. We still have mastitis. We still have pneumonia. We still have things. So, uh, but the calf health uh, seems to have gotten just just a scotch better over the years, and we also believe it's the right thing to do. Um, we started this quite a while back, uh, trying to make our herd better, trying to be sustainable for the future, keep more heifers, uh, keep growing, and we think it's the right thing to do from that uh, standpoint. So, that concludes my uh, presentation. We'll be here for questions. Thank, thanks, Kelly. Our, our fifth and uh, final participant here is, is Lindsey Graber. Lindsey is the Director of, the, of Marketing and Communications for the Livestock Marketing Association, so it's a privilege to have the LMA represented here today. But in addition to that, Lindsey has a uh, has degree as a master's degree from uh, Texas Tech U University. Uh, she's uh, and previous to that a, a BS from K State. Uh, she's a Kansas native, a fifth generation cattle producer, 
uh, but she's also now becoming involved in a seed stock Charlet ranch in northwest Missouri with her fiance. So with that, uh, she's got a lot of experience uh, coming on the board here. So go ahead. Well, thank you for the introduction, and also thank you for the invitation to be here to speak on behalf of livestock auction markets in the United States. I think that one of the most important things to know about the markets in relation to BVD is that market owner operators are committed to the transparency of the health status in relation to PI positive calves for sale at their markets when that information is given to them um, on those animals upon arrival. Once they come to the market, I think most of you know that those animals that are coming into the facility will be quarantined to eliminate any of that nose-to-nose -nose contact with other animals that are in that facility. Once they come through the sale ring, the, um, the market will disclose the health status of those PI positive calves. Depending on what market you're at on that sale day, that could look a couple of different ways. Sometimes it might just be an announcement from the sale block, not any different than any other time you'll be at a sale where they'll disclose the information that could be things about their preconditioning program that that producer would have used, genetic information, are these reputation calves, things like that that um, help the buyers in the seats really get to know what those animals are that are coming through the sale ring. So it could just be an announcement that, hey, these are PI positive calves coming through the ring. Some markets will identify them in, in a way like ch putting chalk on their rib cage that says PI positive. Um, I think that to take that a little bit further, it's one of the bigger issues that comes with BVD and, and animals moving through a market is permanent identification. I don't think that um, it's, it's a new thing that's been brought into this discussion to know that permanent ID is an issue. But, um, you know, in an example in that an animal could come to market A, be disclosed to that market that it's PI positive, be announced from the block, maybe even have chalk on its herb cage or an ear tag put in its ear and sold to somebody out in the stands that day, it could go home, go out in the country, stay there for a few weeks, maybe that chalk goes away, maybe that ear tag goes away, or if it was just a disclosure and that animal's out in the country for a couple of weeks, it's going to lose its identity and then turn up at another auction market 100 miles down the road and not be disclosed as PI positive. So in that event, there is no permanent ID, and then that disclosure from a, a previously responsible producer doesn't get carried on to that next purchaser, maybe the person who does do the testing and realize, hey, I bought this calf and it is PI positive. Um, I think the other thing, too, is that maybe it doesn't get sold at another market. It's just sold out in the country to somebody and not disclosed that it is PI positive. So um, on the whole, permanent ID is one of the bigger issues with these PI positive calves coming through the markets. We have seen some um, proactive approaches in Oklahoma. Their state LMA association has really stepped up and said, we want to be proactive on this issue with BVD in our state and the animals moving through our markets that, that are PI positive. So currently that state association is um, working on getting a brand registered in their state that would be a PI positive or a PI plus brand um, that the markets could use. And um, obviously they've got some... They've got some things to work out with that and making sure that the availability of the brand is there and that it doesn't interfere with other people who might have a similar brand that could just be a PI brand. So we've seen that as a proactive approach from, from some of our markets um, throughout the country. But um, one of the other issues that we've seen with BVD in the markets is um, in, in areas where producers might be moving away from a state or trying to transport animals across state lines or sell them out in the country to get away from from regulations that have to do with PI positive animals moving through market. So, um, you know, those are a few of the issues we've seen. I know that it's not earth shattering news. It's not groundbreaking news that there are some issues with um, market incentive. I'll echo thoughts that I know that have already been said, but any market owner operator will tell you that animals coming through market that are disclosed as PI positive will sell at a discount. Obviously, um, the discount will be there if they are announced as PI positive or marked as PI positive, and in the event that they are showing some signs, that discount will come at, at a higher level. Um, on the flip side, I think you all know that if they're announced as BVD negative, there's not going to be any market incentive for them to be sold um, at the market. So for some of those producers who might have paid 
lots of money, thousands of dollars for that testing, and then they receive no market incentive when they go through market that they are BVD negative is ob obviously um, one of the other the other issues with with testing. So um, I, I know you know those are some brief comments, probably not anything maybe that's relatively new, but. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion, to any questions you might have from a, a market perspective um, in the United States. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, first, I want to apologize here. We, we sort of have limited visibility for the panel. Uh, we've looked into set, setting the podium off and apparently the wiring won't allow it so we're going to have to improvise a little more than we'd like so uh, I guess please bear with us uh, so at any rate so we'd ask uh, when there are questions if the panelists could uh, just please just step over to the podium and, and answer the question at the podium if you could so appreciate that so with that uh, we will open the floor up to questions for our panelists While you're thinking, I've got a question for Kelly. One of the challenges for, in the beef industry is when producers purchase replace, purchase pregnant replacement heifers to calve them out is you know, the, the issue of, of testing or not of the newborn calf. You have implemented that in your operation. Can you describe a little bit more logistically how, what that looks like in your dairy? Uh, with the pregnant heifers coming on, how they calve, how does your crew manage uh, getting that testing done? Well, I'll try to answer uh, as best I can. We, we uh, like I say, are growing, so we're constantly buying, buying springing heifers and bringing them in. Uh, when they come to our facility, uh, we do put a new permanent uh, ID in there. I thank the lady here for talking about the ID because I did forget about that. Uh, they get an EID, they get two big yellow all-flex ear tags, um, and then they're kind of registered under us uh, from there. Then we treat that springer just like we treat our own. She comes in, uh, goes right in with our uh, close-up heifers in, in a separate pen, and then she's calved out, um, uh, and her baby heifer calf is tested just like ours. And uh, when we put the permanent EID in the mom, then we uh, sample her and, uh, and send that away. Our, our downfall in this whole biosecurity thing is, is we don't have a place to isolate those heifers. Uh, once they come in, they get tags right off the truck, and then they go right in with our uh, home-raised close-up heifers. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, we have some risk there. Uh, that's why we just constantly uh, keep checking the baby heifer calves and, and uh, culling, you know, or, or euthanizing as we find the positives. Please, please, please don't go. I have a question for uh, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, you notice a, a difference in the health of the calves uh, after you start the program. Uh, have you noticed any difference on uh, reproductive rates of cattle? I mean, you mentioned about mastitis and uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 respiratory problems, but not reproduction. Have you seen anything on that field? Okay, uh, two things. Num number one, uh, uh, I, I don't think I can necessarily say Repro has been better since we started the program due to, due to uh, testing for BVD. Our reproductive rates that we get today are light years ahead of where they were 10 and 15 years ago. Uh, we do a pregnancy rate on cows, and, you know, 10 years ago, if we would achieve the 17, 18, 19 percent Repro rate, I mean, we were rock stars. It was working perfectly. Today, I'm setting at way more milk than I was 10 years ago, and I got a pregnancy rate between 26 and 28. So is it due to BVD testing? I don't know. Is it due to uh, putting an emphasis in ge genetic selection for, for better repro? I don't know, but we'll take it. Uh, we, we're enjoying it. Nowhere even close to the beef guys. I mean, the beef guys would be out of business with, with pregnancy rates like ours, but ours has improved dramatically in the last several years. Thank you. Would one of the panelists uh, comment on the, the uh, 
cost effectiveness of the size of the pool in, in a, in a, and, and the um, reliability of, of using pooled samples versus uh, individuals? I, uh, Mr. Keith, maybe. We don't pool samples at our facility. We're all individual. So each calf comes in as individually tagged, and we, pick, we take an ear notch out of each individual calf. We do that for two reasons. We're on a computer system that tracks health. Um, that way we can track health on every, every, every calf all the way through. Those health records can go all the way to uh, the feed yard or uh, the background or whoever, whoever wants them. That way they've got a document of you know, what that calf has had, what his history has been. Uh, so we, we don't pool. We, we test every individual calf. I know Kelly uh, pools samples, and I think Brian doesn't either. So I, I really can't speak to that. Maybe Kelly can or Daryl can. But, um. okay. Jeez, I am the odd guy out here. <laughs> All right. Because I got a lot going on, uh, I didn't have these numbers, so I texted my wife, Christy, my team, uh, how much it cost, and uh, it costs $1.81 for each of the 20 pooled notches. If the pool is positive, it costs about 5 bucks individually, to 5 bucks uh, per sample to run the, the individual. So $1.81 if, if times 20 uh, if they're negative, and then they charge me five and a quarter more to test that 20 if, if one within that 20 tests positive. So I don't know. That's not a lot of money in my mind. Uh, we waste a lot more money on other things than, than we do on that. So I, I think it's reasonable uh, for where we're looking at. We probably have, we send samples in weekly, and I'm going to tell you that uh, probably every other month we'll have a positive pool and they'll do individuals. And, you know, so one out of eight probably they'll have a, uh, a positive. I'm going to also say that 80% of the ones where they have a positive, once they do the individuals, come back negative. So that's kind of where we've, what we've seen. Our individual cost of, on our deal runs about 360, I think it's 364 head, you know, on an individual calf is what ours costs. So I'll share that with you. I have a question for Kelly again. I was going to ask you to stay right up there. But, okay. um, two questions, actually, and I'm not asking specifically about your particular operation, but we've talked a lot about BVD. What is your perspective on the dairy industry side of things? Is BVD as big a problem or a bigger problem than Yoni's disease? And I guess let me, I'll ask the second question relative to your operation. You do a lot of biosecurity and a lot of BVD testing. Do you do any Yoni's disease testing? Oh, man, good questions. Um, we we currently do not do any Yoni's testing. Um, to answer that, my perspective on the industry, I have a handful of buddies that milk a lot of cows, a lot more than I do, and I'm the only guy that's testing uh, for anything, BVD, Yoni's. I mean, I, I don't even know if any... Um, Anybody that hardly even speaks about Yoni's anymore. Probably 15, 10, 15 years ago, there was some talk about it, and there, I think Pennsylvania or some states maybe in the Northeast did some Yoni's programs. I don't think any of that ever caught on out here very much. Uh, and currently, uh, there's probably a slight bit more talk about BVD in the business, but uh, uh, not a lot of people testing or looking. In my herd, uh, there's a lot of smart guys in here. Uh, I think we got things under control. Maybe we don't on BVD. Uh, Yonis, uh, I think, well, how, how did you go about in, in your talk? I, I think I've got it under control, but maybe, maybe I don't know enough to, uh, to uh, uh, back that up. Uh, we do have uh, that certain number of cattle that uh, freshen, start milking heavy, uh, lose weight drastically, have some diarrhea symptoms, some scouring symptoms, and just go. I'm suspecting yonis on some of those cattle, but we currently don't look at it and don't test it. So I might have my head in the sand on yonis. But 
I guess a question that, that I have for my local vet and, and, and those in the room here as well, I mean, we're, we're, what should we start looking for next? There's a whole plethora of things out there that we can test for and look for. Uh, is Yoni's the next thing once we think we have a handle on, on BVD? Is it Lepto Harjo uh, that's out there that could potentially be causing me some problems? We have late-term abortions and in, in, uh, in, in cattle. Uh, don't know the cause of that, so... Um, I don't know. I think the impact is, is fairly uh, large, but I think the turnover rate in dairy, people have just accepted it, and, you know, they think we'll just have another heifer to take place of the one that's not performing well. I got a question about the PI calves and what to do with them. Uh, it doesn't need to be a rocket scientist that if I can come here buy a calf today, heavily discounted price, and go three rivers away and sell it for full price, I'm going to do that. So I wonder if it's not fair for the industry to buy this and destroy them and be done with. We're not talking about a lot of cows or a lot of calves. And we're not, compared to the size of the industry, the damage that it does, it's... Uh, uh, I believe doable, but the question is, how do we organize to pay for this? I guess uh, my veterinarian has shared with me that Germany here several years ago enacted a program through the government where they came in and tested every cow in the country. And the government paid you to put down any cow in the country they found positive. And then they tested all the calves for two years. And they paid you for whatever calves they found, they put them down. And they no longer have a problem with BBD. PI calves, BBD is no longer a problem there. I think that's where the direction that we need to lobby and our state veterinarians need to get on board. And I think that's the direction we need to go. Maybe if we could get all these calves tested, and I said this during the conference call the other day, if we could test every cow in the United States, and every calf, before it becomes merchantable, whether it be arriving at the sale barn, animal ID can start there also, test every calf through the barn, set up a lab, set up an IDEX lab right there. They can test those calves as they come in, identify them, get them out, get them off the market, then we don't have a problem. Dr. Gibbons scared me to death this morning when he said, I don't know what's in that meat. And I've been selling that meat to my neighbors, and it goes to the local you know, is that going to be the next problem? I, I don't want to cause a black eye for our industry. I don't want to be a poster child selling a PI calf. But, you know, that's that's where we are today, and that's what, you know, that that's our best out today. But I would lobby. I'd be the first one to stand up and say we need to test every cow in the country, and we need to test every calf for two or three years and get rid of them, get them off the market, and then we don't have this problem year in, year out. Let's do it as beef producers or, or something there. I'm not a Bernie Sanders supporter, and, and uh, we, need to, we, need to, we need to self-fund this. We don't need to go with our hand out asking for help, I don't think, to, to do this. It's, it's not a lot of cattle, as you mentioned, and, and this needs to be something we kind of keep inside our group and, and wipe this thing out and, and get, get it handled, I think. I think just in response to that, Dr. Peel's not here. But in a little side conversation I had with him just prior to lunch, he mentioned to me, he said, look, we, we understand this problem pretty well and can solve it from an individual perspective. We can understand it and solve it from a herd perspective. He said, to your very question, the challenge is from a systems perspective. And that's really where we need to get. And I think that's ultimately probably why we're here today, right, is, okay, we're laying the groundwork. The next step is is from a systems perspective and address it from an industry-wide and ultimately then from a consumer perspective. Because it's not, and it's just not quality or safety, it's also the cost of the product and, and efficiencies that we do it with. But great question, and I think it's great discussion. I think um, just to, to add a few more comments to what uh, he had to say is that from a, a market's perspective, and, and Brian mentioned that, uh, we could look at testing all those animals as they come through a market. And I think that 
you know, from a market's standpoint, we are open to having those conversations about testing animals as they arrive at the market. But with that come, just like anything, some things to consider. Um, one of the things to consider is who's going to bear the cost of putting up all of those labs? Who's going to bear the cost of doing the testing and actually completing the testing? What will the workforce look like on that? Um, the second issue with that is that um, on the market side, we are concerned with the speed of commerce at some markets. Um, Animals are still being received while the sale is ongoing, and how would setting up a lab and testing animals as they arrive at that market affect the speed of commerce um, for those markets who have a sale every week? Here you go, Carl. <clears throat> so I don't want to let the guy from the southeast get away, so uh, I, I'd like to ask him a question. I'm trying to hide back here. And not uh, him, but... Being a cow cap producer. And being from the southeast, where there's a lot of smaller producers in that, a lot of these programs that are developed are, well, if the cow-calf producer would just do that to the calf when he was born, then we'd be all right, and all the other guys don't have to pay anything, but you do. I guess my, th my question to you is, what is your perception of, for sake of better term, that mentality. My perception is as good as that program sounds, it never happened. Uh, you know, I, I begin to divide out producers, not, not by the size of the herd, that's not a good one, but, you know, do, do they have handling facilities at all? You know, the, 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 we can, the, the calves that we handle at birth, we can get them tested. I think most of those guys are willing to entertain that discussion. We're talking about the calves that are never seen by humans till it's gathering time. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We'd all like to improve it, but, I mean, that program's not going to happen. And we've got enough guys out there that are worried about little black helicopters to start with. I can just imagine the rhetoric and the political storm that would accompany this. So just being a realist here, I don't. So the next question is you don't think it'll happen? No, sir. I, again, I would be in favor of a voluntary program that allows me and my operation to make that decision. Uh, to achieve whatever level of certification that's associated with that and for a market to incentivize that behavior. Uh, the problem, and I mentioned this on the conference call the other day, is when guys start doing all that stuff, uh, they tend to get other things right as well. The genetics are a little better. The, the, the entire herd health portfolio looks better. Uh, when we started doing that, I ended up feeding calves with Mr. Busby. You know, we, we, we were going to capture some of that. So I like the, the sidebar of that, but... It didn't really change that pool of calves that we're talking about, maybe the high-risk calves that are coming from outfits that maybe they farm as their first priority and the calves are secondary. But in truth, these guys work 40-plus hours a week, and their spouse is, is working as well, and the kids are in school, and there's just a handful of cows, and just, just difficult. So. Next, uh, okay, my question, as I said here, and I ponder, and I, I don't. I, it's kind of like the meat question, maybe. But when I when I hear Dr. Lawson talk about an hour exposure together, and even the process of us bringing cattle together to process them, being a a a source of um, transmission of BVD to those other animals in that herd. And I think of animals with PIs going through our livestock market and even being identified. Um, how, how do they manage those PI calves going through those livestock markets without exposing the other animals at that market? I mean, is, is there an area that they're kept, isolated? I mean, I, I think we all know that answer, but I think that's another aspect um, that we're asking our livestock markets to accept that that needs I, I don't know what that risk is I, I think I have an idea but you know just something to ponder I think um, you know just to reiterate one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that if a market does know if it's disclosed to them that these calves are PI positive they absolutely do their best to have them quarantined make sure they're not put in in, in any pens that are adjacent to other livestock in the facility not near any water tanks to eliminate that nose to nose contact um, some markets will actually sell them at the very end of the sale 
Um, you know, so it's, I think every market that is, is told that, hey, these are PI positive calves coming in, they do what they can to keep them quarantined. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is one of those things, obviously, to think about, but, but no market is going to take a group of PI calves or one PI calf at that matter and commingle it with things that they don't know on or they do know are BVD negative. They're, that, that's not something that, um, crosses their minds. It's not something they do. Um, they simply do keep them quarantined. It's what happens outside of that livestock market when somebody buys that calf for 50 cents on a dollar fifty or a two dollar market and they take him home and rub the paint off and pull the tags off and two weeks later he winds up down the road that you know he's right back in the deal and I, I'm sure that's happening today. My point is is that we're asking you know we're we're telling people to sell them or not telling people but that's that's an option that's being taken. And and then you know our livestock markets are trying to provide a service to their producers, and they're trying, on both ends, they're trying to keep the animals at the market um, as free from disease as possible, and yet the individual that brings in this PI, they're, they're trying to keep it isolated and still provide that service to that customer. So is there is there the potential for liability there for those markets? I, I don't know. I, I just wonder what we're asking and if that even should be an option for us to provide, I guess. <clears throat> I don't have the answer, so I have no answer. When you say, when you a, say a, a, liability, a liability, could you, could you just clarify that a little, that a little bit? Think about it, I mean, we're just in a different society now, I guess. So I think if I'm a producer and I'm buying calves from a, a market, and, and somewhere it comes back and I know that this PI calf was at a market, is there a potential there that I could hold that market responsible if those calves come up with PVD as acute infection? Well, I think an important thing to remember and consider here is that the markets are acting as an agent only, and um, they don't ever assume ownership of those animals, and they will disclose that it's a PI positive calf moving through the market if they know that. Obviously, if somebody buys some animals that were not announced as PI positive because the market didn't know, they get home, they test them, you know, they, pull, they do the ear notch, it comes back and says they're PI positive, for sure they might be upset, but if the market doesn't know, they can't disclose that. And I think that um, the markets will do to the best of their ability that they can, um, but in terms of, you know, that liability, I guess my answer would be, you know, they, they're only acting as an agent in that situation, and they're doing the best they can in their, in their own right to keep them quarantined and then disclose their health status to the buyers in the seats. I know that um, there are some market owners out there who will say from the block, if you don't know what BVD is, if you don't understand it, please do not bid on this animal. I oh, wholeheartedly agree with you. I mean, I, I just think it's something, I, I, I definitely support our market systems. I mean, I'm from Missouri, we have a lot of them and we need them. And so I, I I think they're, do, they're all doing the best they can do. I just think it's something, as we look back to looking at some sort of program where they're purchased through some mechanism, I guess is where I think we need to be heading, is to try to figure out a way to get those PIs out of our system through another mechanism. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. I'd like to urge you to rethink some of that, you know, your position on that. Uh, uh, last, well, not, not last year, but the year before, we front-loaded the USA, HA, and the AABLD annual meeting with the BBD symposium, and I'm forgetting his name right now, but it was a, he did a nice environmental study, because uh, this is a question I had for some of the producers up there on as well, is that what are your risks on, or what are your perceived risks and treatment options for facilities and, then, you know, the throwaways, the pathways, the containment units? where you had a PI animal in or come through, and the risk that provides, or the risk to uh, naive animals that are coming through that could be uh, transiently infected with BVD as a result of environmental load of the animal shedding, because we know they can become transiently infected with BVD, not become a PI, but be a TI animal uh, from an environmental load. 
So it provides another risk where, yeah, I put, I put, a, you know, I sent my animals to this auction, and they were clean going through, getting there, and then the end buyer comes back and is saying, you know, they're sick. They have BBD, which you can detect if they have circulating BBD, just not a PI. That was a result of handling PI animals through a facility that didn't take precautions and maybe the two-week leaf time on that throwaway or using type of detergents to clean the thoroughways where those animals were kept and ran through. So maybe look into that a little bit. Okay, good idea. One of the early statements in this panel was that BVD is a people problem. So I'd like to ask you a people question. When we look at the data for the average age of dairy and beef producers now, it's south of age 55. Are we looking at working with different people in 10 or 15 years down the road as these people get out of business? And do you think we're approaching maybe a teachable moment as new people come in? I think I started the, the people discussion, and, and, and yes, but, but that numbers remain relatively stable over time, the age of the producer. And so as the age producers out, we're bringing in younger, but the averages keep it there. I think we, we will see fundamental behavioral changes that are driven by society. You, you know, we're, we're talking about markets and a potential liability here. Every person that buys calves out of there has to assume it's a naive immune system, that, that they've had nothing done and that they're going to break. And, and so as, as a, a producer builds a receiving protocol, it's just that. And, and these guys have been able to do that with relatively carte blanche and antimicrobials and antibacterials. We, we appear to be approaching a period in time where that's not the case anymore. And what happens to a high-risk calf? And the, the market, the free market side of me says, well, we're going to further disincentivize and, and create dramatic discount on calves with, with no history doesn't mean they've not had the full suite of products. There's just no way to verify it, and there's no way to put that calf with enough volume to justify the person handling it to, to segregate it and assume that risk. So I, I hope behaviors change, but as an industry, we're, we're just terribly slow when it comes to, to accepting change. I've I got a comment. <laughs> do I, if, an, if I need an interpreter, please tell me. <clears throat> I, I can do that. <laughs> Dr. Gibbons. But be... But being from the southeast, Jim, also a state animal health official, just have a couple of comments. And to start off with, let me say that on another species and another disease issue, we, we, we used to test a lot of hogs for pseudorabies, and, and we would wind up in some, uh, some odd places in the southeast testing hogs. And one, one old, um, who's now passed on, he's a good friend of mine, Federal AHT, he described it this way, uh, w w because they would always, we'd always try to connect them to feral pigs, okay? If we had pseudorabies anymore, we want to we wanna see that that's a feral pig. And he'd describe it that where we were going, you, you couldn't tell the difference between who was feral, the pigs or the people. <laughs> and so I wasn't going to say anything Dr. Ripath asked this question. As you drive around uh, Alabama, South Alabama especially, you, you'll see the, uh, and, and I mentioned this to Dr. Uh, Grotolution at the break, you, you'll see more and more catch pens, uh, little lots that are all grown up in weeds now. And that, that catch pen had a head catch on the, on the front end of two posts, and that was it. And some barbed wire fence stretched around a little bit, and some one-by-fours was the alleyway. Are you kidding me? So Dr. Givens, if I'm right, I'm, I'm, I'm and I usually am. <laughs> yeah. But what, what, what you see now as you drive around the southeast and the rural communities is more and more uh, uh, squeeze chutes and sweet pens and and uh, those guys that are in beef production now, beef, and we, we are, we are a, a milk import state, a chicken export state, and a beef calf export state. So, so we, we, we are now, I think those guys are at a teachable 
uh, maybe a new teachable age about something like BVD. That was the comments I wanted to make. So now may be the time. The only problem for me, Joe Baker, is to decide or, or, or ask the panelists or this group, do, do we want to go to the level, and, and maybe Dr. Stout is going to clear this up for me. Is, is BVD, do we regulate, the state animal health officials regulate that PI positive calf, or do we look for ways to incentivize the, a free status program, or both? So I, I do think, though, Dr. Ridpath is in the South. I think that and we want to we produce those good calves for you guys, and I think we, we can do that, and, and we want to do that. And I think there may be a moving that, turning that um, battleship takes some time, but there, there, there's, uh, there's fewer and fewer feral people. <laughs> Can in you teach those outbreak. guys in the southeast how to use a, a knife? Oh, yeah, well. A, I, I, my, my guys would greatly yeah, appreciate it if, we, if they could just, while you're yeah, teaching them about yeah, BVD, hand them a castrating knife. And, and, and so, so the, 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 the other um, indicator that we're still feral is that calves are still going through the market with uh, testicles. We can't, I, and, and, and I, I, I don't know exactly what we do about that, but you're exactly right. So just a few comments. Do we regulate this? Do you want us to regulate? And that's something that we're going to go back, and we, we, we tried it eight or ten years ago in Alabama, and um, it was like I mentioned in our meeting yesterday. We, you know, we tried to do some things our own way in the South one time, and, and it don't... <laughs> It did. It did. It didn't go too well for us. <laughs> yes, I, you know, and so we we're just now getting paved roads because of that. But anyway, I forgot now what I was going to ask. But anyway, do we regulate it? Do you want us to regulate this, or state veterinarians, or not, or do we work look for ways to incentivize a negative? Status. My, my state, my state veterinarian sitting next to you. No, we we don't want regulation, but but we we do want good policies. We want far thinking policies. This is me speaking personally. Uh, we we want to reward people who do the right things, and I don't like the word punish, but certainly not reward poor behaviors. But the reason calves leave the south with testicles is, is you set in the barn and a calf with testicles shows up, he brings the same money as a steer right after him. I'm not blaming anybody. You hear people talk about the benefits of the testicles and growth. I didn't mean to talk about testicles this much, but hey, that's what, what we're doing. But, but, but again, that's, you know, that, that's the issue. It, once that market begins to, to discount that bull calf, I think the behaviors will follow. There, there's a price break in there somewhere. Uh, if nothing else, somebody will buy that bull calf and take it home and, and castrate it and bring it back. So.